And we're back with Say That Answer. For $5,000, what city Pass. is best known for entertainment? South Carolina. Besides Hollywood. Oh, is that a city? South America. Hey y'all, Scott here. I'm an idiot. So you watch all these game shows and you think you have what it takes to make it big. Then they happen to ask the one question you didn't write on your skin. This isn't over. I'm going back on Say That Answer, but this time, I'll be prepared. Write that down. I want to feel smart, but I don't want to do anything about it. I'm a genius! Game shows are the cornerstone of lazy consumable entertainment. Watching contestants from an audience come up on stage and make themselves look like an idiot. I can do better than them. Obviously, most game shows have to do with contestants answering trivia questions. That makes them enjoyable to watch at home because then you can play along. But have you ever wanted to be on the actual game show? I have. That's why most major game shows get video game adaptations. Of course, there were board games, books, there were ways you could kind of feel like you were on the actual shows, but video games offered the most realistic experience. You got the visuals, the sounds, the hosts, all of this adding up to giving you the illusion Pat Sajak exists. Of course, if I want to actually win at an actual game show, I can't think of a better way to prep than to play game show games. I'll finally find out what trivia was in 1989. This is Jeopardy on the NES. See, I always use outdated sources of trivia while studying. I mean, they were right at some point. It's the only way I know everything about the 33 states. Jeopardy on the NES was developed by Rare. They, of course, made Donkey Kong Country, Banjo-Kazooie, GoldenEye, but before all of that, they said, dear God, let's work on something else. Number of players? One. Skill level? If there was a four, I'd hit it. Versus computer? Yes, please. And now for my name. You know, Jeopardy was created by Merv Griffin. It was produced by Merv Griffin Enterprises. I'll be Merv Griffin, home field advantage. Of course, only Merv Griffiths, but at least we have a healthy selection of characters to shuffle through. So this is how God made humanity. We're up against Larry, we're up against Sandy, they're up against death. Okay, so categories. I get to pick the first one. Oh, oh, fishy names. Fishy names! I'm an expert on this stuff. Former FCC chairman called TV of Vast Laceland. Uh, Alright, so I'll buzz in and figure out the answer as I type. You have to type your entire answer in and there's a time limit, so if you just realize the answer is Lemony Snicket, you better be a quick typer. Oh my god, how could Jeopardy be wrong?! Well, now Larry's deciding to chime in. Oh, thank God. If Larry got that one right, I would not know what to do with this degree. All right, this tiny short-haired dog is originally from Mexico. Easy, Chihuahua. I forget how to spell it, so hopefully they'll get the gist. I really only know fishy names. Larry, what do you got? All right, this is ridiculous. I'm getting shafted. Larry's just lost it. Sandy's not doing a damn thing. Half of this is better than none glass of water. But I'm right! You know, if I want to get as good at this whole knowledge thing as possible, I need to play multiple games at once, so while we have Jeopardy for the NES going, let's play Family Feud on the Super Nintendo. Family Feud is the best game show. You have to try and guess what a group of people answered in a survey. Now, why does it have to involve two families as the contestants? Well, why is Larry out of his mind? With Family Feud SNES, I'm not looking to be seen next to another Larry. I'd rather challenge myself. We'll plug in two controllers. I'm playing as the Kevin family, who's up against the Dan family. All right, name something you take from room to room. A cat! Back to Jeopardy. Oh, look at Larry using an ampersand in his Jeopardy answer. Now I have some standards to live up to. One who has full membership in a state or nation. Me? A carnival performer who bites the heads off of live chickens. Oh, it's really quite obvious. <laughs> oh, that's right, Larry knows all about this. What is a geek? I really need to reevaluate what I am. Back to Family Feud. If you had four extra hours a day, what would you do? Elope. Not elope. Go. Family Feud SNES. Well, that's a good sign to expand to Wheel of Fortune. You can't have Jeopardy without Wheel of Fortune. Both products of Merv Griffin, Merv Gur around these parts. It's all about spinning a wheel for dollar amounts and trying to figure out what saying or word is on the board. Pretty much, if a Jeopardy video game was available on a console, a Wheel of Fortune one would be there too. So, just for a bit more variety, let's try Wheel of Fortune on PlayStation 2. This menu's background's making me sick. Alright, let's spin the wheel! Too bad, but I guess it could have been worse. Yeah, if I died. All right, what is this? Eh. Mineral water. No. 
We're going back to Jeopardy. She is Mel Lazarus's cartoon strip character. Oh, oh, I know this. Damn it, Sandy. She stole my answer. On to Double Jeopardy, where we have brand new categories with even scarier prices. Feathered friends going for a thousand. I know everything about this. I should have remembered Larry does too. Crime and punishment for a thousand. Though defended by this famous lawyer, Leopold and Lode were convicted of kidnapping and murder. Of course he would know. This band leader married his vocalist Harriet Hilliard. Pass. All right, so we're in final Jeopardy on Jeopardy for NES and my earnings so far, I can make up for in the final round. On the final Jeopardy in which Merv Gurr has no winnings and cannot take part in. Well, I live to see this screen. Wasn't fun. Name something. Milk. That comes in a spray can. Milk again. I may need a walkthrough. Might as well check out the other Jeopardies. See, after Jeopardy Jeopardy, Red made a few others, including Jeopardy Junior Edition. I'll stick with Merv Griffin, but downgrade him to Merv Junior. Yeah, this is the same thing as last time, but now with more kid-oriented questions. These are the exact same games with different questions. Moving on to Jeopardy 25th Anniversary Edition. Oh my god, 25, that's so old. We're old, Merv. It's the same game. Yes, the abbreviation for neighborhoods, Naborhoods. You know, who wants to be a millionaire second edition for the PlayStation 1 wouldn't abbreviate like that. You know, this game was published by Sony themselves. That must mean they really believed in this title. I mean, why wouldn't you? Huh? 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 On closer inspection, I swear I owned this game for PC way back in the day. I played a ton of this. May not be the best material to practice with for future game shows. Most of these questions are probably lodged in the back of my skull somewhere, but no harm in trying. Again, home field advantage. They ask for a name, what else would I choose? Go on, just type in your name. I should probably check to see if I spell millionaire right. Oh, come on, you do know your name, don't you? Fine, how about this name? Well, I'm not gonna do that on Say That Answer. Super Jeopardy was also released on the NES. This one wasn't along the same lines as the previous three. These were developed by Rare. This was a nightmare. It talks. So here are our contestants. Is this a newspaper political cartoon? Eh, it's still Jeopardy, but the older versions, in my opinion, are better. You see, for some reason, the color palettes and format they chose for Super Jeopardy just aren't as appealing to the eyes, and it's honestly a bit harder to read. I was Super Merv here. All right, a thing. Apparently an R is the third letter in the word. It's not Fort Wario, I checked. Dork Boney. Card Banco. Park Bench. Okay, come on. First question on who wants to be a millionaire? Okay, well, I'll phone a friend. She thinks it's B. Should probably ask the audience to be sure. Narrow it down 50 50. Well, the audience says it's A, but you know, I never trusted this audience. It's because I wasn't a millionaire. I don't want to see the second question, anyways. Who needs it? Besides Hollywood, what? What city is known for entertainment? Oh my god. Th this was the question that messed me up on the game show! Damn it! Besides Hollywood, okay. Not Hollywood and not South Carolina. That was pure instincts typing that in. Okay, not South America. I'm really disappointed in myself. Okay, a city known for entertainment. Circuit City. Am I wrong? Jeopardy made the jump to the PlayStation 2, right alongside Wheel of Fortune, and these games share roughly the same format of menus and cutscenes. Just a heads up, do not write years out in letters and then finish them off with numbers. They don't accept that. This type of abandoned town features 170 buildings. Oh, oh, for Wario! Wasn't in Wheel of Fortune, has to be here. Regrettably, no. <laughs> I wish. The year the man seen here won the presidential election. Take a look at your monitor. Alex Trebek! Name something that's... Snake. Snake! What's the first thing you open when you... The womb! What's the first thing you open when you come home at night? Jars? Car door. My mouth. What are the answers? I said door! You know, I played a lot of Jeopardy on the Wii. This was released in tandem with Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Surprised. But these games do a phenomenal job replicating the source material. Sure, the hosts look like they drank expired water, but the looks and sounds are perfect. Compare that to Jeopardy on the Nintendo Switch. Like, yeah, it's a fine trivia game, but this doesn't look like Jeopardy. They have so many different original animations and the narrator isn't the same as the show. It doesn't feel like Jeopardy. You can say, oh, but the Switch version is more original. It has its own identity. But when I'm buying a game, 
called Jeopardy. I expect it to look and sound like Jeopardy. There's something to be said about being original, but this just doesn't feel right. I mean, even the PS2 games did a good job replicating the shows. Though, why does Wheel of Fortune on PS2 use the Price is Right font in-game? Well, that's a good sign to try out the Price is Right on Wii. This game's all about guessing the right price on the product shown. See, if the Price is Right, you know what else is? Me. I had a billiards table. I'll go ten. No. Twelve dollars. All right, so now it's time to play Plinko. I just have to drop this puck and see if it. Oh, 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 oh! oh! I did it! I'm a genius! I'm ready to go back and say that answer. For ten thousand dollars, what was the second question? Who wants to be a millionaire? Second edition for PlayStation One. A triple treat, three layers deep, ten cinnabon mini rolls to eat, and a pizza plus another pizza. The triple treat box, only from Pizza Hut. Wait a minute. What's the recipe for surprising the kids? Treating yourself and ditching dish duty? You're looking at it. Order your Pizza Hut faves like original pan, original stuffed crust, and more at PizzaHut.com. No one out pizzas the hut. Hi, thanks for joining the Pain Motors quarterly earnings call. And now I'll turn you over to our new CEO. The numbers last quarter were rough. Mia culpa. <laughs> well, not mea culpa, actually. They a culpa. Let's sell the crap out of this car. It looks like the car was assembled by a spider on LSD, who also had bad taste. It, it, it tested well. American Auto premieres January 4th on NBC, and watch two episodes now on Peacock. Scott here. I could certainly go for a definition right about now. Well, times three. Localized. To make or become local. Well, at least one of us found our calling today, and if you excuse me, I'm going to be ordering a shipment of notebooks to localize for the Tucson, Arizona area so they can more clearly understand them. They just don't get it over there. I know, finally, someone's standing up for the people of Tucson, right? Translation and localization, a Venn diagram's two best friends. There's so many similarities, but overall, they're definitely different. Translation is taking words and converting them from a different language, while localization is taking the general concept of something and adjusting it or even completely changing it for a different audience in a different part of the world. Translation and localization are not one, however, localization involves translation. Of course, in the video game industry, localization is a huge aspect of development and is many times overlooked. Sometimes localization is as simple as hitting the Go Translate button. This was definitely the case with games back in the 80s and early 90s. Old school RPGs and games with heavy amounts of text generally had very little effort put into the localization. Instead of rewriting a game's script to feel more at home for the new audience's area, 
it would basically be just a straight translation with multiple grammatical and spelling errors. But other times, especially nowadays, localization can be as daunting of a task as developing a whole new game. The script for the 3DS remake of Dragon Quest VII filled an entire bookshelf, now that's a localization. The process generally starts during the development of the game nowadays, originally it would start after the game originally released. A team of translators and writers will receive updates and explanations from the developers of how certain scenes and characters are meant to be portrayed, then the localization team will start to rewrite them to feel natural in the new language, while also keeping the spirit and main idea from the original. However, sometimes some things are just too darn exotic. Many elements from many games are different across the world based on cultural norms. What may be okay in one country is totally like way not okay in another. Recently, with the aid of everybody's favorite, the internet, it's been blatantly obvious when something has changed from the original release. Nintendo of America has always been notorious for changing up elements of games for a western release. Back in the 80s and 90s, they had a strict policy on the lack of violence, sexuality, and religion, but as Japan has different cultural norms, these policies led to editing and censoring localized versions of Japanese games. To this day, they are still very keen on stripping anything too sexy from their games. Of course, Japan is much more down for sexuality in media, so it makes sense sometimes to tone things down in westernized releases. The US version of Bravely Default made some outfits much less revealing and upped the age of minors in the game. Xenoblade Chronicles X totally let you customize boob size, but that was completely stripped out of the western release. Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE had ages increased, more clothes added to some mega skin shots, and just some racy shots altered to be anti-racy shots. Fatal Frame Made in a Blackwater featured unlockable costumes which allowed you to play in barely a costume, and this was just straight up removed and replaced with some Nintendo crossover outfits, as the game was published by Nintendo. These aren't anything that affect gameplay in any way, however, many players weren't too happy with the changes, bellowing censorship. I don't know, you see a lot of these things don't make sense for the western world, and just don't make sense in context of the game, like Fatal Frame is a horror game. Does it really make sense to play the game in anti-clothes? But to be fair, it was always supposed to be M-rated, leaving the costumes in a game intended not only for adults, but a rather niche audience wouldn't start riots in the street in my opinion. It's all about how these changes affect gameplay in my opinion, and in those examples, they don't. Those are all cosmetic and make more sense in terms of the Japanese market. However, sometimes pockets of gameplay are removed in localizations, in which Fire Emblem Fates had a few instances of this. Fates allowed you to pet the characters with the stylus coinciding with the relationship building mechanic in the game. Basically, pet the character, they'll like you better. This was completely gutted from the western release due to the suggestive connotations. Also, the Japanese version of the game included a scene where a homosexual character is drugged and cured of said homosexuality, which may be considered as, say it with me now, GAY CONVERSION THERAPY! Yep, that's gone from our stomping grounds. Yeah, it's unfortunate when entire pockets of gameplay are removed for international releases, but... I mean... GAY CONVERSION THERAPY! Localized changes to games have been happening for years, and Earthbound Ness is naked here in Japan, but has the audacity to wear pajamas in North America. The arcade beat-em-up Final Fight featured the female character Poison as an enemy, but when making the transition to North America, Capcom didn't want people to get all up in arms about the player being up a woman, so instead of changing her sprite to some dude, they just said she was a dude. Huh. When Contra was being localized to Europe, they changed the title to Probotector and made human characters robotic due to potential conflict with the gunplay in the game. Many a times, blood in games is straight up removed or turned into some funk-riddled color. Zombies Ain't My Neighbors had the blood removed here in North America, yet Uncharted Drake's Fortune had the blood removed in Japan, and in PAL territories, Castlevania Bloodlines had the blood removed and the title changed to Castlevania The New Generation. The character Soda Pompinski in Punch-Out was originally named Vodka Drunkenski in Japan, oh boy. It's not just suggestive elements that are changed throughout regions, a lot of the time translation just F's with the script and changes the meaning of certain aspects of the game. The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes was a light-hearted, don't-take-me-seriously multiplayer Zelda title for the 3DS. So the American localization team took that as an opportunity to cram internet memes into a Zelda game, while the European version feels much more Zelda-like in terms of the script. Final Fantasy X featured the characters Yuna tell Titus, I love you, while the Japanese version translated to a simple thanks. Yeah, those two sayings don't necessarily mean the same thing. I've never played Final Fantasy X or X2, and from what people say, it's not super weird, but when you take into consideration what the original intended that line to mean, it definitely leads to some solid discussion and analysis I have no right to get into. The Kirby games have a long history of changes while being localized. Not so much with the actual games themselves, but with the box art. Apparently, Americans hate the concept of Kirby being a happy-go-lucky tuft of god knows what, so loads of Kirby box arts in North America give him some solid, angry eyebrows to imply that he's not just having fun, but having fun with some attitude. 
Sometimes localization is just too much for some games, and they're simply left to rot in Japan. The most famous example has been Mother 3, a part of the series we know as Earthbound. It was the final entry in the series, and was originally in development for the Nintendo 64 DD, was cancelled, then resurrected as a Game Boy Advance game. Of course, it never made its way over here, which is unfortunate, and also incredibly infuriating based on how much Mother 3 is referenced in games like Super Smash Bros. This has led to a dedicated group of fans to translate the game themselves, which is how most people outside of Japan have played it. Captain Rainbow was a a Wii game developed by Skip, creators of Chibi Robo, and focused on a has-been superhero trying to regain his popularity and meeting up with a few Nintendo characters that time forgot. Now with Mother 3 and Captain Rainbow, these are two titles with a fair amount of text, and being such obscure niche games in the time of their release, localization just never happened. With Dead or Alive Extreme 3, that wasn't localized due to being too honkin' sexy. I can picture the American reviews as I speak. A spin-off of the fighting game franchise, Dead or Alive Extreme is a beach volleyball game, and when the third one released for PS4 and PS Vita, Koei Tecmo announced it would never make its way over stateside. But this is why censorship generally happens. Cultural differences. It's not all about censorship and differences between cultural norms, however. Sometimes localization will change or remove something for different reasons or for no reason at all. One of the earliest examples of a game being changed drastically in the conversion from Japan to North America was Super Mario Bros. 2 on the NES, as it wasn't the Japanese version at all. The original Super Mario Bros. 2 was meant to be a game for those who mastered the original. It was incredibly similar to the first game, but with some jacked up difficulty. When Nintendo of America received the game, they noted it was too difficult and similar to the original. Thus, they took another game with some Mario-like elements, Doki Doki Panic, plopped some Mario sprites in, made a few extra changes, bada bing bada boom, the sequel to end all sequels. Of course, both the American version of Super Mario Bros. 2 made its way to Japan as Super Mario USA, and the Japanese version made its way over here as Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels. Of course, there's good localization, where the new interpretation houses the spirit of the original, but is now understandable to those in a different part of the world. And there's bad localization that could either be a sloppy quick translation or remove slash change elements for no good reason. But it's incredibly interesting to see just what was lost in the process of localization. But it's odd to look at how some things are censored in one territory, but similar things aren't. Like why is blood in games not okay in Japan, but okay sometimes? I mean, this is the same country that was home to the classic Famicom game, Hitler's Resurrection, Top Secret, a game about guess who's coming back, also known as Bionic Commando here. I got in the notebooks I have to localize for Tucson, Arizona. Hopefully there's not much I have to change. Jesus! New York detectives have seen it all. You want to give that family justice? And only we can take you to the scene of the crime. The person who did this murder was very familiar with the Opera House. It takes a city of dreams to create these nightmares. It was a world-famous pizzeria. Does this have something to do with the Mafia? New York Homicide, a new series, premieres Saturday, January 1st, only on Oxygen True Crime. You can do whatever you want to something if it's on your property. Um, legally speaking, that's not... Let's go make a car. What are you doing to my car? Stealing your hubcaps. It's fine. I'm the new CEO. American Auto, January 4th on NBC. And watch two episodes now on Peacock.
Hey y'all, Scott here. I just got bread for a dollar. That's one of my biggest fears, was talking to somebody they really liked him. Turned out they weren't a person, they were just an affordable price. I despise deals. Somebody offered me a TV for $20, I talked him up to 40 So it's a good thing deals can't find me here. That's why I boarded the doors, it's their Achilles heel. I've known this for a while, that's why I keep nailed wood around my neck. With all those deals out there, I guess I just have to wait out the storm with games like Sportsman's Pack, two great games. Breach! Video games are a business. The sooner I realized that, the smaller my family tree got. So you rope in the suckers who are willing to spend money and 60 of it on brand new releases. Then rope in the more reasonable suckers when the price gets dropped over time. But let me ask you, what's better than one game? You got me there. Well, you know, you have multiple games that may have outlasted their shelf life. Maybe you put them together in one package for an affordable price and you never no, know, it may just no, appeal to a brand no, new audience. No. I don't speak for everyone here, but getting multiple items bundled into one product makes things a whole lot easier. You killed two birds with one stone. I could get toilet paper by itself, or I could save a trip and buy it with ranch. And hey, video games take up a lot of space. Here's my Glover room. You get multiple video games in one affordable package. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking game compilations, stuff like Namco Museum, Sonic Mega Collection, those are taking old games you couldn't already play on that console and doing the unthinkable. Value packed games take games you could already play on said system and bundling them together to make things more wacky and pathetic. These products just exist for people to go, wow, two in one. They aren't for fans, they aren't for diehards, they're merely in existence to make for better presents to give to kids half the time. It makes things more enticing, I can just buy this and get two presents out of the way. It's just odd because I don't ever think of these things. Nobody does. I didn't think too many of these multi-packs existed until I realized one of the most famous products of all time is a multi-pack. Bic? Two-in-one Super Mario Brothers slash Duck Hunt. You know, much like Opium, you couldn't buy this at the store. This was bundled in with most Nintendo Entertainment System consoles and is easily one of the most common video games in existence. But I don't need to tell you that. You're probably already sitting on five of them. Obviously, this saves space in the console box while maintaining the value of two games included. And one of my favorite things about these multi-packs is seeing what kind of menu system they put in place to select the games. <laughs> me. I have never found a mate that can do this. Mario and Duck Hunt is such a wonderful combination. They're so different yet fit so well together. When you're bored with one, the other should do the trick, and it's a good mix of traditional platforming gameplay and bloodshed. Most of the time, you'll see manufacturers put similar games together in one cartridge, but honestly, I really like what Nintendo did here. Two completely different games, but two games where most people interested in one would like the other. So f it, add a third. Three in one, Super Mario Brothers slash Duck Hunt slash World Class Track Meet. The exact same song and dance as the last cartridge, but we finally have some value. World Class Track Meet used the power pad, all great world powers do. So adding a game where you have to run to a game where you e-run and a game where you get put on a list, you have a nice sampler of what the NES had to offer at the time. And while this cartridge does bring a lot of variety with it, it is a bit clunky that all games included require different controllers. So yeah, watch me, cool party trick. I can play Track Meet after Duck Hunt in record time. Does anyone have a power pad in their trunk? I'll be right back. So then maybe this cartridge is a bit more worthwhile. Three in one, Super Mario Brothers slash Tetris slash Nintendo World Cup. There were three horsemen of the apocalypse. This multi-pack was only released in Europe and is somewhat hard to come by. And unlike the others, this got a full retail release. The games included are all your traditional NES games that use just the standard controller, so it's a more comfortable experience. I think Mario and Tetris go together quite well and Nintendo World Cup does satiate the jack of the family. Uh, no, I want to play soccer, thank you. I'm no I don't like shapes. The multi-game cartridges weren't just a Nintendo thing, though. Sega did them on the Master System, and even before that, they existed on the Atari 2600. Here's the Double Ender cartridge, where each end gives you a different game. I'm appalled and enthralled. But these value pack games truly became a hot commodity with Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt, especially if they were console bundles. I'm sure many looked at that and went, wow, I cannot give a too. Combining pre-existing games into one product is an easy and effective way to get people to care if there was no way anybody would care otherwise. So you know Sega kept doing it. Sonic Classics, huh? Remember the classic Sonic games? It's 1997 and they sure don't make them like they used to in 1994. It's like when they re-released the first Call of Duty as Call of Duty Classic. This game's six years old. Sonic 1, 2, and Dr. Robotnik's Mean Beam Machine all in one cartridge. This should be a staple in every multi-pack. But this cartridge pales in comparison to one Sega released earlier. Six pack. This one is a doozy. Sonic the Hedgehog, Golden Axe, Columns, Revenge of Shinobi, Super Hang on Streets of Rage. Now this is a solid collection. I like these multi-packs with value and variety. When you have Sonic 1 and 2 included on the same cartridge, like, yeah, I'll accept it. But I'm probably just gonna play Sonic 2.
And when you have Mean Bean Machine next to it on top of that, it's no contest. Well, did Nintendo have any value packs that could compete with something like this? Here's Super Mario All-Stars plus Super Mario World. Nintendo was trying to claim more dependence than they had that year. So basically, for some Super Nintendo console bundles, they included this exclusive version of Mario All-Stars with Mario World added in, and it's all pretty seamless. You'd think they just have a game select screen that says, listen, f what do you want? But no, Mario World is incorporated into Mario All-Stars. They changed the title screen up, added the box art alongside all the other Mario games. They even updated Mario World itself a bit, changing how Luigi looks to make him look more Luigi. It's a strange amount of effort put into a simple multi-cart that was only available in specific SNES console bundles that were also only available for a limited amount of time. It's a shame this wasn't given a more wide release. Whenever Nintendo decides to re-release Mario All-Stars, it's always the original version, not the one with Mario World included. Maybe because it doesn't have Mean Bean Machine. Well. Well, I'm disgusted, which is why, thankfully, as game consoles evolved, it became harder and harder to cram multiple games onto one cartridge. So, with the invention of discs, it became more and more feasible to put multiple games into one package, one of the greatest evolutions in gaming. Have you ever noticed ever since this release, life has been now this is the definition of a multi-pack. Two discs in one! I'm sure manufacturers were thrilled about this. I mean, you don't even have to program any menu setup. You can just take the exact same discs you printed for the standard copies and combine them with some others, print some new box art, and bam, you just gave up. The case itself often isn't even much bigger. You can fit quite a few discs in a standard sized case. There was no downside to this. But Tetris with Star Wars, I don't give a fuck. I saw Sega do this a lot. Here we have a Sonic Mega Collection Plus and Super Monkey Ball Deluxe Combo Pack for the original Xbox. It was released as a budget platinum hits title, and I gotta admit, these seven adjectives sold me. Obviously, this was a good deal. There's no lying to yourself about that. But there's something about these types of value packs that just feel cheaper to me. I wonder why. You don't get the original artwork, you get it all cropped and smaller, the spine looks dumb, this box looks like it's constantly trying to sell me on something I already own. It's like how movies are sold these days. So many flicks are forever destined to be exclusively sold in four movie packs, and you get this generic template logo on the front and on the spine, it's like, where do I put this in my collection? There's four completely different movies on it. Alphabetically, do I put this where the first movie they happen to list here goes? Like, why does this movie have more worth than this one? The same with Mega Collection and Monkey Ball. But at least with Sonic and Monkey Ball, these are both two similarly styled series. Uh, Sega also released a combo pack of Sega GT 2002 and Jet Set Radio Future because you know what? It roughly meets the requirements of a deal. Actually, this one was released only in certain console bundles and everything comes packed on one disc. That's pretty impressive. Xbox had some interesting dual pack console bundle sort of deals. They usually like to do this combo style on the spine. One side of the box had box art for one game. Oh, oh God, what about the other? Oh, thank Christ. I wouldn't take a sh for anything less than Tetris Worlds. They continue this general style throughout the Xbox 360's lifespan and even into the Xbox One's a bit. Except this one, you just get a very basic front and back. Back covers just aren't the same anymore. Over on the GameCube, they had a few shining examples like the Wind Waker and Metroid Prime console bundle combo pack. What a deal! It does save shelf space. Some companies started to do these box sets. They were cardboard sleeves housing full copies of the games. Again, a few of these have skyrocketed in value. Some Sega box sets on the GameCube specifically. The Devil May Cry 5th Anniversary Collection, because let's celebrate it being 30 years off from running for office. And the Grand Theft Auto Trilogy, containing all the home console GTAs of that generation. This one I've seen wrapped for $20 at Walmarts everywhere, usually next to Nicorette. Of course, these don't take up any less space if you don't start to comprehend the power of one millimeter of cardboard. These are the full set game boxes in here. The outer sleeve is just kind of neat. Fresh bonus, use it for food. Sony did this a ton with greatest hits re-releases. You can get some double packs of games this way, and a handful of GameCube and Xbox releases were like this as well. But I want a deal and more space for my feet. Well, the Game Boy Advance was truly a safe haven for value pack games. See, this system was so laser focused on kids and people who would buy Drill Dozer. Just so many releases. Games were flying everywhere. It was wildly popular. People were buying damn near anything on it. Game development on the platform was cheap as dirt. Of course the market was flooded. And when a game's popularity started to dwindle, publishers took it as an opportunity to repackage it alongside another or two on one Game Boy Advance cartridge for the ultimate Easter gift. This just screams Easter to me. These things were everywhere on the Game Boy Advance. I mean, it makes sense. The file sizes of these games were ass small. You could pop multiple on a cartridge and sell them for a deal, and it's even more attractive based on the portability factor. This way, you could bring two games on the road instead of just one. But I never realized just how many were released. For the kids, obviously, there's a lot of licensed games combined onto one cartridge. The Shark Tale and Shrek 2 combo cartridge, for when you just can't pick who to shoot. SpongeBob SquarePants Super Sponge and SpongeBob SquarePants Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. You know, I 
love Super Sponge on the PlayStation 1, I always wanted it for the Game Boy Advance. Couple that with a Game Boy Advance game I did own being included on the cartridge, and I'm pretty miffed I never owned this until now. Just think about how different my life would be if I had this as a kid. However, I mean, these are both SpongeBob games, both 2D platformers. At least with the Shrek and Shark Tale combo, we had some variety in brand. Well, don't you worry, because THQ did release a multi-cart with Super Sponge on it, and three other games. The fabled 4-in-1. I've seen staplers with better labels. It's pretty cool considering this one has all different Nickelodeon shows represented within each game, just like Sportsman's Pack. Fishing or hunting? I, I, I don't care, just give me a gun. Cartoon Network had this double pack here. Listen, I'm just saying, you could always tell a Cartoon Network kit from a Nickelodeon one. We were a respectable breed. But hey, licensed games weren't the only culprits. Sonic Advance and Pinball Party, Pac-Man World and Maze Madness, double, triple, or even quadruple packs on Game Boy Advance were a way of life. Even when it came to movies. The Game Boy Advance video double pack featuring Shark Tale and Shrek. Not Shark Tale and Shrek 2, Shark Tale and Shrek. The movies, not the games. Most of the content released via Game Boy Advance video were television shows, but a few movies were released, and two of those movies were squeezed onto a single cartridge for some reason. I think Majestic could just one of their dad's approval. This is a fairly impressive accomplishment for the time. Most games on these combo cartridges weren't compromised, but with these movies, they definitely look worse than they did on their own single carts. It's a sacrifice, but you were already sacrificing a bit to watch movies on the Game Boy Advance anyway, so at the time, this did the job. A triple treat, three layers deep, ten cinnabon mini rolls to eat, and the pizza plus another pizza. The triple treat box, only from Pizza Hut. Series, we make the headsets, mice, and keyboards that the world's best gamers win the most well. And we've been doing it since way back. It's up to you how far you go, but whatever you do, go for glory. What's the recipe for surprising the kids, treating yourself, and ditching dish duty? You're looking at it. Order your Pizza Hut faves like original pan, original stuffed crust, and more at PizzaHut.com. No one out pizzas the hut. The Game Boy Advance was a wild time to multi-pack, oh, that generation specifically. There was a ton, but they never went away. I just don't think anybody really notices them. They just exist for people who could use them, but don't leave much of an impression other than that. There's been some interesting cases, like Lego Harry Potter on Wii, plus the first Harry Potter movie on DVD, or when DiGiorno packed pizza and breadsticks together. This is an interesting one that I didn't know existed until recently. A few Wii systems came bundled in with both Wii Sports and Wii Sports Resort, but I never knew they came on the same disc and had a unique startup and menu select screen. I want to wear this disc as a ring. I love it. The Bioshock and Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion double pack. Because f 
That's why. And he has remixed Pack on Wii U, taking two digital-only Wii U titles and not only releasing them physically, but packing them on the same disc. NES Remix 1 and 2 are pretty much the exact same game, but with different NES titles represented. Pokemon's been doing these box set releases if you want both of the Pokemon games that come out at the same time. And Nintendo's done this thing where Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Super Mario Party are bundled together. There's basically a million ways to purchase all the Kingdom Hearts games on PlayStation 4. This one has the HD remasters of 1, 2, and Dream Drop Distance, and this one has all of that. And the third game, at a painfully low price. It's really unfortunate if somebody just wants to play the first game and nothing more. You, you're getting all of them. It's like how junk food's cheaper than fruit. Throughout all of this though, it's clear to me Sega is the most consistent at releasing multi-packs. They've done it ever since the Sega Master System and they did it with the Nintendo Switch. The Sonic Mania plus Team Sonic Racing double pack and the Banana Blitz HD plus Sonic Forces double pack. Which one's the better value? The Nintendo Switch has had a few multi-pack game card releases where when you pop the game card in, both games just appear on the menu, which is pretty slick. So even when these Sega releases are just on one card, they don't have a unique menu setup or whatever. The the system just acts like you put in two game cards at once. But nothing Sega does will ever live up to their Sonic PC Collection release. If you include all the games included in Sonic Mega Collection Plus and the unlockable bonus games in Sonic Adventure DX, there are nearly 30 games in this set. At that point, did they really have to include Sonic Riders? Oh man, we can't just not include one more game. The people won't fall for that. They aren't stupid. They like Sonic! And there's a lot more of these things than I initially thought, and it's getting to the point where I feel like I just have to embrace the fact they exist. As some people still like to have physical games, but they like the slimmer packaging with two discs in one. It's cool to see the unique menus, and while the box art is compromised and kinda cheesy, I can't help but admire the fact that these bundles help bring in new customers that may not have experienced these games otherwise. Wait. I mean, ha ha ha! these things. Hey all, Scott here. Imagine today's events occurring in the past. What would it be like to live in an era prior to this very moment? I wonder what I'm gonna say in five minutes. What the hell is this? Why is it good? We need to go a hint closer to utter dog sh I said a hint. The year is 1987. This is what we call a video game. That was a short game of 20 questions. At the time, things could only go up graphically. They were trying all kinds of 3D styles. Some games you could hear crystal clear sound in with voice acting, and other games were movies you could slightly interact with. The future was looking bright. Imagine what video games will look like 30 years from now. Holy f it's wider? What's the main driving force behind new video game consoles? Better graphics. I'll let you shoot me in the foot if you look nice. We all want our video games to look better each and every generation, but sometimes it's fun not to care. The graphical style of older games were simpler, no doubt, but there was a certain magic to it, that old school Atari 2600 look. It's crude, it's not great, but there's something to be said about making the simplest of art understandable to the player, making it obvious to them that these are aliens in four pixels or less. It's oddly beautiful. Let the record show, I'm also legally blind. But when we move into the 8-bit and 16-bit eras, these are much easier to find worth in. A similar style of making the most out of limitations, but this feels more like actual art somebody drew that was then squished into a cartridge. 16-bit art is so much better too. This was taking pixel art and adding so many more colors and details in the music of this era. Oh my god, it may be a bunch of bleeps and bloops, but it's all organized in such catchy and mesmerizing ways. Again, it's so cool how they would make something so beautiful out of something so limiting. And due to how simple things were, it was easier to immediately understand what made these games tick. Modern games are so full of cutscenes and 3D eye candy that it can sometimes distract you from the core of the game, which might not be that great. Because of this, the style of older games has never really died out, not only because less powerful handheld systems kept 2D pixelated jargon alive while the home consoles tried shoving polygons down our throat, but because people legitimately like these art styles, this music, these simpler, more get-to-the-chase type games. It doesn't just remind people who peaked in high school of better times, some just like this kind of stuff. The problem is, most think older games look outdated, and 99% of the time, they would be correct. So to get modern gamers to play the classics, you might just have to remake them, giving them new visuals with all kinds of crazy effects, a fully orchestrated soundtrack, even more content. But like I said, Many still value this older style of game, while well, some want these older games to be recreated for the modern age. What if we took this modern thing and tried to recreate it using this rock? This is a demake, remaking a game on worse and or older hardware, possibly generations older, or it's just made in the style of older titles. It's interesting to see how a modern game works when it's met with the limitations of living in 1994. It doesn't. Most demakes are fan-made. 
Makes sense. If Nintendo isn't gonna put Smash Brothers on a Game Boy, damn it, I'm gonna. One of the most famous examples of this is Halo 2600, a demake of Halo for the Atari 2600. Now, to be fair, this is more completely different game in comparison to straight up playing Halo on Atari. Like, how do you even begin to port these graphics over? Well, we can do the color green. No, this is turning the concept of Halo's story, characters, and some of the gameplay and trying to make it work as an old school Atari game. It's pretty neat to think about how you recontextualize things that have only ever been seen in first person 3D into a 2D sprite, and not just any 2D sprite, a bad one. However, I think what made this game truly famous in the D make realm was the fact it was made by one Ed Fries. He was actually the vice president of Microsoft's game publishing division up until 2004. So can you really consider this a fan made D make when it was made by a Microsoft employee who worked with the Halo series? Well, this is far from official, Fries really this in 2010, six years after he left Microsoft, and even if he was still working at Microsoft when he made this, it was just a hobby project to attempt to make a Halo game for the Atari 2600. But it's more official than pretty much any other unofficial D makes, so you gotta give it credit. I think the Atari D makes are pretty interesting because I feel like you can make most games conceptually work on an NES or SNES with little issue. I mean, they would look and play wildly different, but I could fully imagine D makes of The Last of Us and Dark Souls on those platforms. These consoles can produce high quality gameplay and stories. Atari is a different beast. You pretty much have to rethink a game and turn it into a high score kind of deal. But fans have shown loads of talent by producing demakes of Super Mario Brothers and The Legend of Zelda. Mario is pretty impressively close. Zelda? has more in common with a loading screen. But these are fan creations, the video game false profit. What about official D makes? Well, they aren't the most common, but when they happen, they really double dragon on Atari 2600. Gazoon height. You truly see the power of the D-Make with Atari. I mean, this thing runs on pencil lead. How are you gonna make Donkey Kong Jr. work on Atari? You don't. Now, Atari seems to be the furthest we can go back in terms of D-Making, but how much simpler can we get? It's dangerous to ask me words. So we have Double Dragon on Atari or Double Dragon the LCD handheld game. Pick your poison. I feel that many would disagree with the notion that these are D-Makes, but if you consider Halo 2600 to be a D-Make, I think these fit the bill. This was the cheap alternative to buying a real man's handheld. The Tiger Electronics LCD games took the full name and branding of arcade and console games and made calculators out of them. These often are nowhere near replacements for the actual things, rather reinterpretations of the classics that can be displayed in a sticky notes worth of screen real estate. And damn it if that isn't a D-Make. Tiger games are pretty gross. They take the bare minimum concept of these games and make this a high score based, overly simplistic romp that's just an endurance test. Hey, see how long you can use your thumbs. York to follow a dream and she died very violently New York detectives have seen it all and only we can take you to the scene of the crime New York homicide a new series premieres Saturday January 1st only on oxygen true crime joining the Pain Motors quarterly earnings call. And now I'll turn you over to our new CEO. The numbers last quarter were rough. Mia culpa. <laughs> well, not mea culpa, actually. Vea culpa. Let's sell the crap out of this car. It looks like the car was assembled by a spider on LSD who also had bad taste. It, it, it tested well. American Auto premieres January 4th on NBC and watch two episodes now on Peacock. Nintendo had their own LCD games with the Game & Watch brand in which they themselves converted their games over to. These, however, are much more well-designed. They're still simplistic, but there's more of an addictive challenge to these compared to what I found in a morgue. And when the game they were demaking for Game & Watch was too complicated for the LCD screens, they would make something entirely new for them, like with Super Mario Bros. and Zelda. The LCD demake is probably as low as we can go, unless you count charades. So, instead of pathetic, let's try for 
Bazaar, my new store. Sega hit it big with the Sega Genesis here in North America with their previous console, the Sega Master System. Look at it. Does it look like it would do well here? Maybe Brazil. The Master System was a long lasting success in Europe and Brazil. They just loved grid paper and failure. While the console ended in 1992 here in the States, it lived on for years longer in other regions, especially in Brazil where it has yet to be officially discontinued. Maybe they just forgot. But because of this success, D makes a popular Sega Genesis games were common for the platform. Sonic came over, though more so in specially designed games for the Master System. Streets of Rage, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, because good versions of those games weren't good enough. But the D make I want to focus on here is Street Fighter 2. Yeah, Street Fighter 2 on the Sega Master System, because damn, does that sound good right about now? Round one, fight. That hits the spot. Honestly, for a version of Street Fighter 2 on an 8-bit console, it's pretty good. I mean, character moves are missing, so it's not like a full-fledged port. It's not like this is the full Street Fighter 2 experience, just a little worse. Yeah, this banana was run over by my cart, but it's still a full experience. Nah, this simply does the job for Master System owners who wanted Street Fighter 2 and not much else. Graphically, I think this looks pretty damn good. Audioly? I do enjoy making soundtracks with elevators. For what it's worth, Street Fighter 2 on Master System is fascinating. It only released in Brazil in 1997 and Capcom greenlit it because they were duped into thinking this was a Sega Genesis version of the game. The developer then revealed they were playing on the Master System and they said, wow, this stunk for the Genesis, but for the Master System, this could be worse. It was approved. Well, I'd rather play this than the Game Boy version, which that's its only a D-make. The portable variant of a game was almost always lesser in every way. But just like Street Fighter on Master System, it could be worse. I think many Game Boy D-makes are fairly impressive. I mean, DuckTales on this thing is damn close to DuckTales how God intended. Developers had to choose whether to make a version of the game designed with the Game Boy in mind, or just try to cram funny in the car. It's a balancing act. Would it really be easier to make a Lion King game for the NES, or just take the SNES game and downgrade the hell out of it? This looks unnatural. Like, I feel like if I would play this as a kid, I would still think to myself, this feels like a downgraded version of something that already exists. I mean, designing a game from scratch for system is a lot of work, but it's also really hard to get the Lion King on SNES to run on the NES. You know the old saying. The NES got a few deem makes. I'd consider Mighty Final Fight to be one of these. This is a Final Fight game made exclusively for the NES. It's a retelling of the first game's story, so I would consider this a deem make. Take that, Senate. However, everything else is really this game's own thing. If you consider Final Fantasy VII Remake to be a remake, give Mighty Final Fight a chance. This is definitely more of a spoof on the original. They made all the characters children and built it entirely for the NES. It was definitely meant to give NES owners a Final Fight experience while also making sure it stand on its own, so they made it a joke. I'm a proud NES owner. Mighty Final Fight is its own thing and isn't bogged down by the limitations of the console it's on. Rather, Capcom used the limitations to their advantage while creating this thing. This is how you do a D-make, and it might not even qualify as one. That's why we go back to the Game Boy line with Game Boy Color and Advanced D-makes. Finally, I can play Grand Theft Auto portably. I never said I was happy with my life. For some reason, developers constantly tried to take these big console experiences and shove them on the GBC. Resident Evil was being worked on, and while it was canceled, looking at what was accomplished, it's impressive and concerning. Think about how advanced society would be if we didn't spend so much time porting Resident Evil to Game Boy. I mean, this looks like it's straight up Resident Evil, but what ended up releasing was Resident Evil Gaiden, something more original for the system. They still tried to make it as full-fledged of an RE game as it could be, including this rhythm game combat mechanic to incorporate first-person shooting, which is honestly pretty clever. And of course, GTA 2. I'm sure not many people knew this was a thing, on top of the fact the first game is on here as well. In fact, that worked on the original Game Boy. These are really not great versions, but just the fact they even resemble a Grand Theft Auto game, I think is enough. But thankfully, Grand Theft Auto on Game Boy Advance is another story. Yeah, most of the joy from this game comes from the fact I'm gutting people on two double A's. But this is a legitimate Grand Theft Auto with not a ton of concessions made. This wouldn't be considered a D-make, however, considering it's a completely original entry in the franchise. Now, Pac-Man World, that just got diagnosed. The Game Boy Advance was filled with multi-platform games that were completely different from handheld to console. I was definitely expecting this to be a 2D platformer based on the PS1 game. Was I ever gleefully disappointed? Hey, they took the PS1 game and transformed it into a 2D spray paradise. Is it better this way? Well, it depends on if you like dog See, this is the biggest issue with D-Makes. It feels like you're punching down. Well, the Game Boy Advance version of Super Sponge isn't as good as the PlayStation one. Well, duh. Of course, what makes these games special is seeing how they convert elements that could only be done on the more powerful system. Sometimes they whittle them down to their core. Konami couldn't really port the first Silent Hill to Game Boy Advance, or they could, they just knew it wouldn't be pretty. So they converted it into a visual novel released only in Japan. Sometimes developers have to make these calls. Should they D-Make the game for lesser hardware or create something more suited for it? Because even if they work on lesser hardware, I think I, alongside many others, care more about seeing it just exist, not necessarily if it's just as good or better than the source material. However, 
That can happen sometimes. Dark Void was a game, thanks for asking. One of the most forgettable and generic games from the Xbox 360 PS3 era. It was done by Capcom, but it was just so lifeless and lame. Just look at this cover, look at this name. Without the title, would anybody have gone, oh yeah, that's a Dark Void. It's just an underwhelming third person shooter that completely got overshadowed by its spinoff on Nintendo DSiWare. Everybody has that more successful cousin. Dark Void Zero isn't necessarily a demake, but it has the spirit of one. The concept here is, what if Dark Void wasn't an original game? Turns out it was a reboot or sequel to a lost Capcom NES game. You gotta hand it to them, they truly ran with this idea, even putting a fake history lesson in the electronic manual. Totally giving an excuse as to why it's on a dual screen handheld, because it was on the PlayChoice 10 dual screen arcade machine. They even got Jimmy Fallon in on the idea that this was, in fact, originally an NES game. When they break out the talk show host, everybody goes, oh sh on that day, all late night with Jimmy Fallon viewers bought Dark Void Zero. The game itself actually gives off a lot of 80s Capcom vibes. Comparing it to the real life Dark Void, it kind of feels like how Bionic Commando on NES compares to Bionic Commando on Xbox 360. What an insult. The NES style is prime for demake territory. It's more impressive to demake for Atari, but demaking a modern game for NES, well, it just might be playable. Namco demade Pac-Man Championship Edition, turning it into something worthy of being on an NES cartridge. It was included in Namco Museum Archives Volume 1, and Jesus Christ, it might just be better than the original. To be fair, the original Pac-Man Championship Edition is good, but its aesthetic reminds me so much of the Superior Championship Edition's DX and 2 that it's really hard for me to go back to it. Championship Edition on NES? oddly feels fresher even though it looks ass old. It's so addictive, and I think having this gameplay more zoomed in makes everything feel faster. It legitimately feels like its own experience, and honestly, if I had to choose between the two versions, I'm going NES. Retro City Rampage originally started development as an NES demake of Grand Theft Auto. It's a good thing they changed course. While it's obviously inspired by GTA and NES games, the final release is more than that. It's not GTA, and it couldn't run on an NES. While you could still look at it as a spiritual demake, the developer made sure you didn't have to look far for the actual one. Included in the Wii release is ROM City Rampage, a version of the game that runs on NES. Plus, they made a version for MS-DOS on a floppy disk. These people scare me. These are the fun demakes. They bring games to garbage hardware because... Now, downgraded ports, you could totally consider demakes. Doom on Nintendo Switch? Well, they technically did demake it, but that's not really too fun to discuss. Like, here's Rayman Origins on Xbox 360. Now on Wii, now on 3DS. How did they do it? Oh man, they must have found the Gaussian blur effect. But the demaking spirit of going far back is still alive and well. Fans do it all the time. Final Fantasy VII on NES, Super Smash Land on Game Boy, but even Nintendo does it. Their prototype for Breath of the Wild was an NES game. They made Breath of the Wild for NES, and then made Breath of the Wild. Well, this is just a remake. I mean, they are super guilty of demakes in general. Remember the great Nintendo 3DS Wii U ports of 2016 and 17? Yes, Hyrule Warriors Legends. It runs. This is disgusting. I have no idea how anybody played this game legitimately on 3DS. Of course, it runs better on new 3DS models, but so would Molasses. Doesn't make it fast. I don't care. To me, this game just doesn't belong here. This gives off Lion King NES vibes. Just a sense of this not belonging. Everything feels off. Super Mario Maker for Nintendo 3DS, I think, feels more justified and it's still pointless. That's an insult to Mario Maker and an even bigger one to Hyrule Warriors. You can never upload stages with this version. You can only play stages that were uploaded from the Wii U version. At the very least, if they let you transfer stages and made to the Wii U to then upload, it would still be stupid, but at least there would be a way. No, here, there's no point to any of this, though it's still very charming to see this game run on 3DS. I just love how they had to downgrade New Super Mario Bros. U from the Wii U to this platform when New Super Mario Bros. 2 was on it and looked fine. They could have used these assets. No. It doesn't look not fine enough. The new Super Mario Bros. U art style on 3DS is amazingly pixelated, and it's funny because this is the art style they chose to represent on the box. Opuchi and Yoshi's Willy World is a great conversion. It looks and plays great, and I find it very charming how they converted the 3D world map into a 2D one. While the 3D map is cooler on the Wii U version, the 2D one on 3DS just flat out makes more sense. This is a 2D platformer after all. Regardless of if these are good versions of the games, D makes are amazing. They may not be more fun to play, they may just be putrid, but they're just so damn interesting to analyze, every last one of them. To see how a game as massive as Breath of the Wild would work on NES, or just seeing Hyrule Warriors do something it shouldn't, I love seeing games represented in a different way than the norm, and these demakes help you to appreciate the game design. Without all those fancy 3D graphics, most of these games still hold up at their core. In some cases, they can be better not bogged down with cutscenes and loading screens. And it gave us a chance to play Rayman Arena on the PlayStation 1. Yeah, this is weird. So Rayman Rush is a demake of Rayman Arena for PS1. It removes modes and just focuses on this racing game mode. 
that's it. But even though it released after Arena came out in Europe, it released before Arena did here in North America. So if you live in Ohio, is this a demake or is Rayman Arena a remake? What about Final Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition? This is a demake of Final Fantasy 15 for mobile phones. It uses a cutesy new art style and is played from a top-down perspective, but follows a shortened take on the same story. But man, they just oversimplified so much here. As a mobile game, it really likes it when you win, and the game just feels kind of mindless to me. At this point, you're better off just watching Final Fantasy 15 cutscenes on your phone. But then the demake got a remake with Final Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition HD. You can finally play this on Xbox One. Or play Final Fantasy XV, your choice. To be fair, there's merit to both of these games. A lot of people didn't like Final Fantasy XV, so you've got Pocket Edition, but a lot of people don't like Pocket Edition, so it's truly a matter of preference. Except on Nintendo Switch, where this is the only Final Fantasy XV you've got. Because who needs bull when you have dog?